Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Happy Monday, Dr. Paul. Very good, and this is a special day. We have a special guest. Yes. A friend of ours and a friend of Liberty's, uh, David Stockman. David, welcome to our program today. Yeah, Ron, happy to be with you again. Wonderful. to talk about. Wonderful. And uh, you'll be attending our conference on the 24th, and that's going to be uh, great. Uh, I want the uh, viewers to know, because they already, a, a lot of them would know, that you and I have known each other for a while, and we were in the Congress together. And uh, then you skipped off, right? And after you were elected, as I recall, and you and I had been talking about the things that we were going to do, but boy, you got, you got promoted. You became the director of OMB under Reagan when you served uh, that first term there. But uh, I'm sure that was a, a challenge for you, but a real experience. But uh, no, we've known each other for a while. I also recall, uh, David, that about that time, I think it was under Carter, uh, when they were renewing draft registration. And we were fighting that, and we won one vote, then we lost it, and they finally renewed it. I thought of you the other day when I saw this picture of the 16-year-olds, and they say, a picture of a bunch of nice young kids, 16 years old, and they say, the Army is coming up short. We might have to take 16-year-olds in. And I kept thinking, yeah, what if they need them, really? They might even be drafting 16-year-olds. I don't know if you saw that picture, but that really turned me off. Yeah, I can understand that. And, you know, uh, I did learn at OMB that the real swamp in Washington is on the Potomac side of the river. <laughs> and uh, who could have dreamed that even then, as they were doing that uh, Reagan buildup, so-called, uh, that we would end up today with a defense budget that's pushing <laughs> $800 billion if you count everything. And even if you adjust for inflation, it's nearly two times bigger than what Ronald Reagan was seeking, and far uh, more uh, uh, than that, uh, relatively speaking, than what Eisenhower in 1961 said uh, when he gave his famous warning about the military-industrial complex was enough to secure our defense. In other words, in, in today's dollars, Eisenhower said, yeah, 400 billion, 350 billion is more than enough to contain the Soviet Union, at a time when it still wasn't bankrupt, when it had 50,000 tanks on the central front, and uh, you know when there was, uh, for better or worse, a Cold War tension underway. So you know we have to ask the question, and hopefully we can address it at your con uh, conference. How in the world have we gotten to the point in 2019 where there's really no industrial state enemies left in the world? where Washington is dominated by the warfare state and all of the uh, you know, economic uh, consequences that go with that, including what I would call the weaponization of commerce. That's what's happening now. We're not only running, as you talk about a lot, the 100 bases around the world that you know, uh, got 100,000 uh, troops and uh, dependents in Japan, 35,000 still in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. We not only have that, but we're conducting economic warfare against practically <laughs> half of the world. That's there are right. 30 countries, you know, there are 30 countries where we have sanctions or embargoes. And it's not just Venezuela, where we're now trying to choke the economy to death, or the uh, Iran, where we're uh, basically uh, trying to create, I would guess, a mortal enemy for all time, but you know they're spread all over the world. There's something like uh, 400,000 names on the list of sanctioned people, private, public, government officials, businessmen, etc., from all around the world. And this this is something that's not really focused on enough. But frankly, it's the economic warfare that we're conducting yeah. that is uh, you know even more. Um, you know, inv invidious uh, in terms of uh, trying to get a peaceful world than our whole right. military complex. Well, uh, we were looking around for the most dangerous spot of the world, but I think you described it very generalized, and there are all other places, and they're still looking daily for a new monster to destroy, and they go off and on. But there are some that might be a little more dangerous than others, and I think Daniel has a question regarding the, the great dangers we're facing. Yeah, Dave, you make a good point that we don't really have any major industrial enemies as, as we had when the Soviet Union was around. So what do we do? We create them. We create the bogeymen. 
<laughs> to make it, you know, over the excuse for this huge military budget. And one of the ones, and I know you're watching this closely, David, but one of the things that really is coming to mind is China. Uh, it looks like the U.S., the, the, uh, the as people have said, now the maximum pressure policy, it's not on Iran, it's on China. And I'm sure you saw, David, over the weekend, uh, this uh, State Department employee, Julie Ide, uh, who's been all around the Middle East uh, where there's uh, brush fires, uh, was photographed meeting with the leaders of the Hong Kong protest movement. The Chinese government, understandably, is going nuts. They shut the airport down in Hong Kong over the protests. Um, what do you, how, much, how much credence would you give the idea that the U.S. is doing a lot to make this happen, and where do you think it's going to go? Well, you know, I saw that, and it's, uh, you know, I said to myself, here we go again, another color revolution. We know how well that worked out in the Ukraine, a disaster. <laughs> we know how well that worked out in all of the other uh, countries along the so uh, old Russian periphery uh, where we've attempted uh, to stimulate uh, regime change or opposition uh, to uh, uh, Russia. Uh, and to say nothing of the Middle East and all the disasters we've had there. Now, we need to get back uh, to sobriety, I would say, <laughs> that China is not our enemy. It is a terrible, I call it the Red Ponzi, a 40 trillion pile of debt that will ultimately, and malinvestment, that will ultimately collapse on its own weight. But it is not an immediate or even middle term national security threat to the people of Massachusetts, Nebraska, or California. China exports, and Trump is all over this, but he's wrong, you know, for the right reason, uh, for the wrong reason, but $550 billion worth of imports to America every year keep the Chinese economy going. Uh, their, their economy on the margin is entirely dependent on uh, upwards of two and a half trillion that they export to the entire world. So the idea that somehow they're going to become a, an aggressive global military threat, you know, I kind of use a little sarcasm and, you know, ask the question, are they really going to bomb 4,000 Walmarts in America uh, to prove, you know, that uh, their way of life is right and ours is wrong? Well, of course not, because here's the thing that the leadership knows in Beijing, you know, the, the cadre of pretty brutal people around Chairman uh, Xi for life, Chairman for life, and that is that if the export system of the world breaks down, within six months the Chinese economy would be in chaos, and within a year they would probably be hanging from the rafters, you know, of uh, one of the tall uh, skyscrapers uh, in Beijing. So, uh, you know, this business that we're, you know, putting warships into the Straits of Taiwan, uh, all of this yapping that we constantly hear about the South China Sea and we send warships in there because the Chinese, for whatever reason, seem to want to waste their money building sandcastles in the South China Sea. I mean, the whole thing uh, smacks of a warfare state apparatus looking for an enemy, and not only looking for an enemy, but actually trying to uh, provoke uh, hostile actions that uh, can then justify even more money and an even more threatening posture. Right. Now, I sympathize with the people of Hong Kong. It's too bad that they have to be ruled by uh, uh, the kind of economic totalitarians and social totalitarians that rule uh, from Beijing and that, uh, you know, uh, represent the Communist Party. But we can't get in the middle of that. It is not our business to look for monsters to destroy, as you started out, uh, Ron, and what John Quincy Adams uh, famously said in uh, 1821. Uh, and so, therefore, we should be, as, as they used to say, as pure as Caesar's wife uh, when these uh, events unfold. Uh, more power to the protesters, but keep the State Department, and really, you know, uh, this isn't State Department employees. Uh, the, the, the person you referred to uh, allegedly runs the political affairs desk uh, at the council at, uh, in Hong Kong, but obviously, that's not a, a political affairs desk. It's a cover <laughs> for a CIA slot. Right. right. Yeah. So um, we need right. to stay out of that and somehow 
See, here's the thing about Washington. When the Cold War ended, you, you had a whole military, industrial, intelligence, foreign policy apparatus uh, that was out of business in 1991. And they, it should have been wound down and dramatically reduced. We could have reduced the defense budget to a couple hundred billion at most. That We should have dismantled NATO. We should have gotten out of the Korean Peninsula, et cetera, et cetera. But instead, they, they've driven the thing in the opposite direction right. power by this, uh, you know, this uh, war on terror and all the rest of it. So we're at a real crisis point. We've got, you know, we got a fiscal situation that's uh, spiraling out of control as we go into the 2020s. Uh, multi-trillion deficits every year. At the heart of it is this massive waste uh, on the uh, warfare state and the political deal in Washington where all the liberals and statists and big spenders get their domestic uh, uh, pork in return for supporting this yeah. you know, the defense budget. We saw that last week. David, I want to bring up the subject that uh, I generally bring up in many of my talks. That is, of course, how is this financed? And it's, and it's not financed by taxes. I mean, it has to involve the Federal Reserve. And I call the uh, Federal Reserve uh, the great facilitator because it's a taxing organization. You know, it dilutes the money supply and they get purchasing power out of that. It, it takes care of all the deficits, whether it's domestic or foreign, uh, foreign spending. But it's also a central economic planner and it uh, supports the stock market and all on all these things but there are more not, more people now commenting in the mainstream media on some of the financial statements what is the status of central banking I've never I'm amazed at how often it comes up and I've been interviewed on this and uh, it, it before you know when we first went to Congress in the 70s it would never have been discussed but now it's coming up about central banking status and, and what would, would happen? Do you care to venture about how? What is the status of central banking, and is there going to be a radical change uh, in that uh, setup? Well, th that's a great question. And first of all, it's obvious that the Fed has been the enabler of this uh, massive spree of borrowing and national debt that we've had over the last thirty years, because they've monetized the debt. They have bought in the bonds uh, and paid for those bonds, trillions of them, uh, with, uh, you know, money, uh, credit that was snatched out of thin air just by hitting a key on their uh, digital printing press. Now, this is important to understand because back in 1981, when I became budget director, we were fighting the big uh, government monster, uh, the deficits that we inherited from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Carter and the Democrats. The key point was that the uh, balance sheet of the Fed was only $150 billion at that time, and it had taken 65 or more years to get there since it was created. And we had high interest rates, 16%. Even the, the politicians on Capitol Hill, I can remember old Tip O'Neill even agreed that at some point you couldn't keep borrowing money because it was going to crowd out private investment, raise interest rates, uh, hurt uh, households, uh, hurt consumers and business, and you know undermine economic growth. Everybody understood that. Then we got Greenspan in there by accident uh, in the crisis of 1987, the so-called Black Monday meltdown. He's discovered the printing press in the basement of the Echo Building, so to speak, and we've been off to the races ever since. Now today, at the peak, you know, we had four and a half trillion balance sheet at the Fed versus 150 billion when uh, you know when I was there in 1981 in the interim essentially 4.3 trillion of credit was you know uh, seized out of thin air and used to purchase the government debt so what that did of course was dramatically lower interest rates what that did was eliminate the natural, you know, uh, free market uh, adjustment to big government borrowing, and that is the crowding out of private investment. Right. And when you have private investment being crowded out, then the businessmen is impacted, the housing industry impacted, uh, even the consumers who have to pay an arm and a leg for a mortgage all rise up and say, this, does, this isn't good, this doesn't work. You've got to get your uh, fiscal house in order. But under the current regime of central bank, uh, you know, uh, unlimited central bank uh, uh, money printing uh, and debt buying, all of those, you know, forces 
uh, in a democracy that led to at least some fiscal uh, restraint have been eliminated. So the problem today, though, is the central banks have gone so far off the deep end, and the Fed was only the leader of the gang, so to speak. Uh, I told you know I mentioned the four and a half trillion balance sheet of the Fed today. But if you look at all the central banks of the world together, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, even the People's Bank of China, Bank of England, etc., the combined balance sheets of the central banks are now 25 trillion with a T. It's a giant, <laughs> giant number. It compares to two trillion uh, of all of those banks together at the end of the 90s. So essentially, the the thing to say, the thing to understand is that the central banks of the world have printed about 22 trillion of fiat credit uh, over the last uh, two decades. Most of that went to buying up government debt. And so we're now at the point in the world where, you know, you have 15 trillion of debt trading at negative yields, and you have no fiscal restraint anywhere because the central banks have made it so easy. Now, the question is, why will they just keep doing this forever? Can't we just print our way to prosperity and maybe nobody even has to work? We just uh, pick up free money from, from the central banks. Well, the answer is they have painted themselves into a huge corner. This monetary system, one way or another, is going to blow up if they continue to expand these balance sheets and wreck uh, the bond market, uh, which, uh, you know, is a $60 trillion entity in the world. Right. So, okay. Okay, Daniel, what do you have there now? Well, David, you mentioned earlier <clears throat> that NATO should have been shut down after the Cold War. Absolutely correct, and we've talked about this on this show uh, quite a bit. <clears throat> Pardon me. When it comes to NATO and our allies, you probably noticed this in the news today. Uh, you know, our ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, uh, is known for, <laughs> for getting himself in hot water. I don't think he was on the ground uh, an hour in Germany when he landed that he got in trouble for meddling in German politics. Well, he's at it again, and he said, I think on Friday, hey, Germany, if you don't spend that 2% uh, on the military, we're going to pull our troops out. Uh, and an infuriated Germany, which has no intention of, paying, of spending 2% of its uh, budget on the military. And in fact, one German uh, lawmaker said, go for it. <laughs> you know? and, in, and in fact, I'm just seeing there are some polls in Germany showing that the Germans would prefer that we pull our troops out. So I'm wondering now, in, in a weird way, is Trump, by having this sort of a bombastic foreign policy, kind of secretly doing us on interventionists a favor by irritating countries like Germany, where they say, okay, pull them out, get them out of here, we don't want them anymore. <laughs> yeah, 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 you hit, uh, Daniel, you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, I did vote for Trump. I mean, I think half of what he's doing is uh, crazy as hell. It's counterproductive on his trade war and his fiscal debacle, as I call it. But I saw him as the great disruptor who uh, would actually unsettle things so much that maybe the scales will start to fall off people's eyes around the world. And, uh, you know, we won't have the same kind of uh, acquiescence and accommodation. In other words, the greatest thing would be if someday Washington declares a war and no one uh, volunteers to come <laughs> because everybody has been so uh, put off and alienated uh, by uh, the, uh, you know, uh, actions of Donald Trump. Now, let's go to uh, Germany in particular and start with your 35,000 troops. That's a good point. <laughs> and the question, obviously, is what the hell are 35,000 American servicemen doing in Germany 74 years after Hitler descended into Hades <laughs> and 28 years uh, after the Soviet Union slithered off the pages of history. This is a live example of how the warfare state perpetuates itself without any fundamental reason other than to keep going. Uh, everybody who's looked at this realizes that back in the early 90s, uh, uh, 1989 I think it was, uh, Jim Baker, Secretary of State, and Bush the Elder, uh, George Bush the First, uh, promised Gorbachev that in return for um, uh, the unification of Germany that uh, NATO wouldn't expand, quote, one inch to the east. There were 15 countries in NATO. It would have been easy to disband it because at that point the Soviet Union was a basket, I mean, the, the former Soviet Union was a basket case anyway. 
but instead they march down this path over the next 10 or 12 years of adding, uh, you know, another 14 or 15 countries, including these, uh, you know, powerful states like Croatia, uh, Slovenia, Latvia, and now Montenegro. By the way, you know, Montenegro has a entire military force of 1,950 uh, people, which is smaller, last time I checked, than the police force of Austin, Texas. So, you know, the question is, why are we signing up for a Section 5 obligation uh, with Montenegro or any of the rest of them? It's only obviously provoked uh, Russia being on their doorstep. And uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, this latest incident that you mentioned this morning, Daniel, uh, will... Um, cause people in Europe to wake up. Now, the real, tr the real truth here is that Germany, uh, as we know from the last, let's say, 100 years, is not necessarily a nation of pacifists. I think you would agree, after World War I, after Hitler, after World War II, uh, and to say nothing of what they did in the late 19th century. So, if a nation of non-pacifists far closer to the old uh, the re remnants of the Soviet Union, Russia, than we are. Yeah. Right. Determines, you know, determines that 40 billion is, 43 billion is enough for national defense, 1.2% of GDP only. Right. If it concludes that Putin is not a aggressive expansionist uh, Stalin in disguise, and that the Russians won't be at the Brandenburg Gate uh, or occupying the Rhineland any time soon, why don't we uh, accept their conclusion? They know what their uh, national security interest is better than ours. <laughs> Last time I checked, they, they seem to have about 20 operational tanks. 20! <laughs> now, if they thought the Russians were coming, they would have a heck of a lot more than 20 tanks. So, uh, it's a great, great illustration of the massive disconnect between the on-the-ground reality, political, economic, military in the world today and this utterly obsolete post-Cold War warfare state right. imperial <laughs> policy that we have in Washington right. today. Da David, we're going to have to wind this down, but Dan Daniel had a, one short follow-up question on this. Yeah, just a quick follow-up, David, it's just for fun. I, we had Lou Rockwell on uh, last week, and Lou will also be speaking at the conference, as will you, and we're certainly gracious or grateful that you're going to be there with us. But I asked Lou this last week, what would you say to someone who's sitting on the fence? They're not sure they like what they're hearing. Uh, you know, the importance of getting together. I mean, certainly you recognize that uh, getting together, listening to, to great speakers, but also miss, uh, meeting great people. Yeah, I think that's really important. And you know, when it comes to the cause of peace in the world, when it comes to the let's just call it broadly the anti-war movement you know i started as a kid a college kid in that in the 1960s uh, as an anti-vietnam war protester i was a member in fact even a leader of sds but the, the point of it is uh the movement as we called it then uh had an impact because we eventually entered the vietnam war because people of like mind got together and created a force far more, uh, more powerful than any individual involved. Uh -huh. We, you know, I'm not saying we're going to march on the Pentagon, uh, <laughs> from the top, but yeah. you know, those kind, that kind of movement is uh, dead in America. It needs to be rekindled, and the starting point is to get like-minded people together. Uh, for so that people can realize they're not alone. I mean, uh, lots and lots of millions of people in America are sick and tired of this imperial foreign policy, and maybe we're reaching the point in 2020 uh, where somehow mm -hmm. yeah. that on the scoreboard. Yeah. During the I I think that that's uh, going to happen eventually, one way or another. But 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 David, uh, we're looking forward to having you uh, in uh, Alexandria, no, at Dulles on the 24th. And I want to thank you very much for being on today. And uh, we deeply appreciate your working with us in the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. But David, thank you for being with us. Very good, and we look forward to the conference. See you soon. Wonderful. And I want to thank our viewers for tuning in today for this important program. And please give serious consideration to being with us on the 24th. Thank you, and uh, come back to the Liberty Report soon.